I know things are a little bit different this morning, and uh, I'm going to take some time to talk about some of the things that we, we face, the things that are on our mind. But before we start that, I want to express um, my feelings right now. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18, Paul instructs the church of Thessalonica to be willing to give thanks in all circumstances, in all situations. And I want you to know I am thankful this morning, one, that we are able to come together and worship. We still do that. Two, I'm thankful this morning for uh, the elders of this congregation to have discussions to deal with things that I know are on, on people's minds, to take steps to show uh, love that we have for each other uh, and also love that we have for those in the world. I want to express my thanks for the women who came down here and with great um, understanding and skill prepared those little cups for us uh, and that uh, they, they took precautions and all that. It was very uh, appreciative uh, on the short notice. I appreciate that. And then um, I want to say I'm thankful to the congregation for uh, your flexibility and your understanding. Uh, a lot of things changing right now, just as Steve said, just in a matter of, of a short period of time. From Wednesday to today, uh, numerous school districts have um, canceled online campus and, cl and classes. They're making adjustments. Uh, our students from Florida are now back here for, you know, for a, a little bit longer period of time than they were expecting due to spring break. And there's a lot of that, that that's going on. And so your flexibility, I appreciate it. And, and I just want to thank you for that. I know a lot of us are thinking about what's going on today. I know that because uh, this is a trend across the country and across the world. Uh, on my, my Facebook feed, I, I am connected with several uh, congregations and preachers, and I have seen several congregations and elderships going through the same kind of questions that our elders in this congregation is going through. I have several feeds on Sunday morning of congregations on the East Coast and those that are in, in the middle of the country, and I get a chance sometimes on Sunday morning to open up my Facebook and to listen to what those preachers are preaching about. Hearing Brother Wilson Adams speak this morning in Tennessee, and then another friend of mine, a close friend of mine, uh, who preaches in Alabama, and all kind of really revolving around the same thing, uh, about the current climate and situation in this country and in the world when it comes to coronavirus. And, and as we ourselves consider these things this morning. In, in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7, Peter says, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. I think we have to admit that people are fearful. People are fearful about the present situation. People are fearful about the future because there are a lot of questions that people have, a lot of knowns and there are a lot of unknowns and this is affecting things. This morning when I got up and did come down to the building and do my usual Sunday routine, it was delayed a little bit more than usual but I went by Starbucks because I had that opportunity this morning at 5 a.m. And I got my, my coffee, and I'm driving here, and I drive right by Vaughn's, and it's about 5.15, 5.20. And outside of Vaughn's, I can see in the night that there were people that were lined up outside waiting for the doors to open. Yesterday, I was getting gas at Costco, and it was before they opened and the parking lot around the building was filled with activity as people were parking and walking to the front of the store waiting to get in. My sister sent me a picture of a grocery store in their neighborhood that they frequent. And out the door line in the midst of rain, undercover, you had probably 20, 30, 40 people 
waiting to get in. There's a lot of questions that people have. We ask questions like, you know, what are the symptoms of this thing that's called coronavirus or COVID-19? What are the symptoms? Because if you're anything like me, you know, you start thinking about these things, you're like, okay, do I have a tickle in my throat? Am I feeling a little bit warm? What, what's going on here? And so you get online and you see fever, cough, shortness of breath. And I don't know about you, but I saw those things. I'm like, that's kind of vague. What do you mean by fever? How much of a fever? What do you mean by cough? Because it's allergy season at the same time. What do you mean by shortness of breath? What do you mean about those things? What happens to people who have this? You know, the, you know, is it is it um, you know where it's just certain people over a certain age that that have uh, issues with it that sadly pass away from it? How do I protect myself? Do I go out and buy a mask, or do I not go out and buy a mask? Do, do I maintain social distance? By the way, we're not shaking hands. Do, do I maintain those kinds of things? What do I do? The, this last week is, you know, you have schools that are closing. You have entertainment that's changing. I mean, sports has stopped. You know, from basketball to hockey to baseball, all this is going on. Why is it that stores are running out of TPay? These are the big questions, aren't they? That we wonder and we ask. And people are fearful. We live in the 21st century where we are bombarded with information. Sometimes that information is good. A lot of times that information is incomplete, and sometimes that information is incorrect. And the result of all of that is we become, as a people, very unsettled. We become upset. Fear sets in. Fret sets in. And so as Christians, we are faced with this question. How do we approach the fears that we have? Some people will say that, that fear and worry and uh, anxiety, that is, cares and concerns, are evidences of faithlessness and weakness. I don't think that's realistic. I don't think that's necessarily accurate. Because there are so many unknowns. We as a people, by our human nature, sometimes fear things. We, we worry about things. The problem is when it becomes excessive. And you might ask the question, what do you mean by excessive? Excessive fear and worry and anxiety is when it starts to blind our vision of God. When it starts to affect our trust in him. Because when I look at scripture, I do see evidences of humanity having fear, worry, and anxiety. Jesus himself, on the night he was betrayed, was sorrowful, it says in Matthew chapter 26. But it also says that he was troubled. Now, if Jesus could be troubled about his circumstances, then we can be troubled about ours as well. Jesus, while he was in the garden, in Luke 22 and verse 44, was praying in agony, and that was evidenced by his sweat becoming like what? Drops of blood. That was mental anguish that he was going through. That was his thinking. In Acts chapter 18, Paul, while he is in, in um, Corinth, he is approached by the Lord in a vision. The Lord says, do not be afraid. Why is it Jesus had to tell Paul that? Because there were certain worries that Paul faced. In chapter 27, when Paul is on his voyage to Rome, and there's all of that turmoil that's surrounding that, he talks about how an angel of the Lord came to him in the middle of the night and said, don't worry, don't be afraid of these things. Fear, worry anxiety. We have to be realistic about them. 
our cares, our concerns. That's natural. It's natural to react that way because some things that we face, the known, that, that this coronavirus, and there are other things that we could talk about, that this known is that it spreads. And that there's going to be a lot of people that get this virus. And so when we know things like that, and there's potential for you know, grave illness and even death, that's scary. The unknown of who has it, you know, in this kind of situation or any other kind of situation, that's shocking. Because today in 21st century, we're supposed to have all the answers. We're supposed to know all these things. And the fact is, we don't. There are a lot of question marks about that. And so when we talk about what's happening and what may happen, yeah, there's grounds for care and concern, but it's excessive fear, excessive worry, excessive anxiety that becomes problematic because what they do is they destroy the peace of mind. They destroy our thinking. They destroy our relationship with God. What was based in, in trust and faith is now more dependent on myself. And that's not what God wants for his people. It destroys relationships with people. And it's in those contexts where Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, don't be anxious. It's in that context that Paul says in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6, do not be anxious about anything. It's not about absolute. Jesus recognized and experienced himself the issue of fear. Let's look at a passage of Scripture. I want to give you just three points. We're going to keep it short this morning. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 through 34, this is what we read. Common, common section of Scripture about anxiety and fear that we see in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, nor about your body, what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive... And tomorrow is thrown into the oven. Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself, sufficient for the day is its own trouble. I want to give you three points, three things that we need to remember as we face known situations and unknown. How do we deal with fear, worry, anxiety, care, concern? Three points. Number one is this. Remember who your father is. Remember your father. Verse 26 and verse 31. Jesus gives three illustrations, and these illustrations are all focused on the point that it's unnecessary to have excessive worry because you are a child of God. And those illustrations are this. Look, verse 26, the birds of the air. Look at the birds of the air and the fact that they don't sow, nor do they reap, nor do they gather into barns. In fact, what they do is they pick up what you sow. They pick up what you leave behind. They don't fly around going, okay, what am I going to eat today? How am I going to survive? That's not what they do. They're not concerned about some unforeseen future. And here's his point. If God, your Father, provides for the birds that are not his children, will he not provide for you? Will he not take care of you? The second illustration in verse 27 is uh, about your life. And what he says is, 
is this, and which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to his span of life? People worry about the health. That, that's why there's so many people getting masks and toilet paper and all that kinds of stuff, which some of it still boggles my mind. That's why we can get pictures of empty stores where people are making a run and they're taking everything they, they can. Is because they're worried about their personal life, their health. I appreciate what Jason read on, on the table th this morning about the difference between prevention and panic. Prevention is good. Panic is bad. Panic and preparation, they're very different. And if you, if you read what, what Doy ha had written, there's certain parts in this that are very applicable. He says, panic is based on fear. Preparation is based on trust. And that's the difference between excessive fear and understandable fear. When our fear gets excessive, we stop to trust God. I have to take care of myself. I have to take care of my needs. Preparation cares for the needs of others. Panic loses sight of others. Preparation submits to God's control. Panic forgets that God is in control. And here's the point. If we excessively worry and panic, is that going to keep you from getting a virus? No. Is it going to add time to your life? No. So why do it? Verse 28, the third illustration is the wildflowers and the grass. If God's going to take care of these flowers, is he not going to take care of you? You look at the flowers and the beauty and the magnificence and the quality of the flowers, the substance that man cannot recreate. And God has bestowed upon those soulless objects love and care. Does he not bestow upon those that are made in his image greater love and care? Absolutely. So why do we need to excessively worry? Remember who it is you believe in. Remember that you're a child of God. Number two, remember your faith. Remember your faith. In verse 31 and 32, of Matthew chapter 6, we read this. Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. We live by faith. We've been talking about that on Sunday mornings, that the just live by faith. Romans chapter 1 verse 17, would just live by faith. We walk, we live, we act we, we, our attitudes are determined by our faith, and that faith is built upon the Word of God. That's what gives us confidence. That's what gives us evidence, if you would, of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Our faith is built on the testimony of God's Word, the Word that's revealed. And when we open up God's word that is revealed, what we see is a picture that God is always faithful. While man might not be faithful, while man might not be loyal, while man might not be committed, God is always faithful. And you look to the people in the past that God kept his promises to. And you look at the people today, and if God did that in the past, then is God not going to also keep his promises today? Well, let's get personal. We also see God's faithfulness in his providence. That God has provided for you what you need. He has provided the things that you need to exist physically. But more importantly, he has provided the things to help us spiritually. So we live by faith, trusting in God. But there's another aspect of the faith that we live by that I want to point out here. In, in verse 30, uh, 32, he says, For the Gentiles seek after all these things. And what Jesus says is there is there's a difference 
between the way Gentiles operate and the way we as Christians ought to operate. Gentiles seek these things. You be different than that. In living by our faith, what we are showing is that worry does not belong in the life of a people of God. And when we live that way, what kind of impact can you have? When you operate day to day and say, I'm not going to be controlled by worry. I'm not going to be dominated by fear. What kind of impact can you have on the people that are around you today that are given to fear and worry excessively? What kind of impact can you have when you operate having your eyes focused above? We might not view it this way. I want you to think about something. This whole situation and people's fears and anxieties and social distancing and all of that kind of stuff, we tend to look at it in a negative light. Can I have you look at it positively? What an opportunity we have to demonstrate to the world outside these walls our faith, to show them that our world circumstances, yeah, there are a lot of question marks. I can be afraid, but my faith in God and his promises can, can help. To be able to show love for others, people that we didn't, don't even know. I was reading th this morning, someone put a, a headline of an article, you know, by, by taking precautions and things like that, you could be saving the life of someone that you don't even know. Isn't that what we're called to is loving people? And that's what we're doing. So you have a great opportunity. If you're at home and your kids are at home and they're not going to school, and, and if you're a teacher, you're not going to school, or you know, something's going on at work and you find yourself at home more often than maybe you would because with sports and activities, our lives get hectic. Use it as an opportunity to sit around the table and talk to your kids about God. Have a devotion. And if you don't come out for, for one of the worships, have a Bible study at home. What a great opportunity we have to really refocus on some of the things that maybe we've lost focus of. And then lastly, remember your future. Why is it people worry? Because they're concerned about the unknown. And that kind of excessive worry can, can warp personality, steal joy, rob peace, foul up relationships, cripple our faith, harm our usefulness, wreck our influence. Because what fear does is it says there's something to be afraid of. While fear says there's something to be afraid of, faith says there's something to look forward to. We don't need to be afraid. I don't know what's going to happen with coronavirus. I don't know what tomorrow holds. Imagine if you did. Imagine if you knew that at the end of this, a million people were going to die. How would that affect you right now? If you knew what was going to happen a minute from now, five minutes from now, five days from now, how would that affect you? Do we look at it from the positive side that the unknown and the fact that we don't know what's going to happen is actually grace of God to help us to deal with situations one day at a time? So I don't know what's going to happen. But I do know this. God is sovereign. God's overall. God's faithful. He will always keep his promises. God is loving. He's always going to do what's in best interest of those that he has created and those that are in relationship with him. And God is gracious. Why? Because God has promised us something better, something grander, something pure than what we have here. Revelation chapter 21 and at verse 4, he says, I saw a new heaven 
and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death will be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying or pain any more, for the former things have passed away. Remember your father. Remember your faith. Remember your hope, what you hope for. Because when the known scares and the unknown shocks, faith settles the heart. Thank you for being here this morning. As we close this morning, we want to give an opportunity to extend the invitation. If there is someone who needs to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ, why not do it today? What an opportunity when we know there, when we know that there's a lot of unknowns, I'll put it that way. What we do know is that one day, we know this for sure, one day you're going to cease to exist in this life. The, the death rate is one out of every one. We're all going to die. We're all going to face Jesus. Why not face him prepared? If we can help you this morning, if you need to be baptized for remission of sins, why not come forward and submit to Christ? We ask you to do that while he stands in this song.